Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Panagiotta Faturu, and uh, I am an associate professor at uh, the Department of Computer Science of the University of Crete, and a collaborating researcher at the Institute of Computer Science of the Foundation of Research and Technology. I am the chair of the Greek ACMW chapter, and I would like to welcome you to the second summit on gender equality in computing. I also serve as the chair of the ACM Europe Council at the moment. Uh, and uh, today, before I open the event, I would like to say a few words about science, computers, and uh, of course, gender equality. I will start by saying a few words about science. And specifically, I would like to uh, explain why I am to, to explain why I am in love with science. So the origin of science is a desire. It is a desire to know causes. And uh, when uh, there is desire in something, there is also pleasure. So science is an imaginative adventure of the mind seeking truth in a world of mystery. Uh, a as a researcher, we often have to face um, uh, problems and we try to solve problems that, uh, the that, that they were unsolved uh, until then. And uh, so the entire community did not know, do not know how to solve them uh, or have not tried to solve them. And therefore, the, the work that we do in order to solve them may open paths that are unknown and uh, also the outcomes may be unknown. This makes science to, uh, to uh, this make us experience science as a great game which is inspiring and refreshing. Even more, the playing field is not a small arena, but it is the, uni the universe itself. In our science, the computer science, it can be the technology of the future. And as a researcher, we sometimes feel when, for instance, we reach a very beautiful research result that uh, we get a little bit, maybe not as much as Albert Einstein did in God's thoughts, and uh, the rest seem like mere details. And uh, I would like to, uh, to, to, to say that uh, uh, to you that your students or young researchers, so this, is just, this, is, this goes basically to young researchers and students, that if you have not uh, yet, um, uh, exper if, if you have not yet explored uh, uh, your, your feelings about science, maybe it, it might be useful to do so because uh, uh, if science is for you, uh, if you experience science like a game and if there is, if you manage to find pleasure there, then this might be helpful for having a successful career. Let me now try to explain why computer science, why I, choose, I chose computer science. Uh, maybe the most important reason is that uh, it uh, address uh, uh, it uh, brings into the picture deep problems. It can address deep problems in a wide range of areas. Here you can see a few examples. Uh, uh, computer science can be used to understand the human brain or how the human brain works uh, or to decode the human genome. Uh, of course, there is also another area is robotics with many applications. And you can see here, for instance, applications in medicine, uh, but also computer science contributes in uh, um, smart, uh, smart cities, smart medicine, smart automotives and the future technologies that might facilitate our lives. Uh, even more, uh, if computer science was not there, were not there, then a lot of things that we use in our everyday life and that make our day life, everyday life uh, uh, pleasurable would not be there as well. Uh, this is the slide by Charles Leiserson from his talk in SPA 2018 in Vienna. And as you can see, uh, without computer science, we would not have electric cars, innovative game technology, deep learning applications, digital photography, high resolution medical imaging, electronic monitors, inexpensive robots, accurate weather prediction systems, our smartphones, wearables, smart appliances, tablets, minions, cloud computing, and of course, all the facilities that are provided by being connected and by having access to the information that we require. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when uh, I was at the point to choose my career, uh, people believed that computer science is a science that has a future, okay. But now we know that computer science influences, not to say determines the future, 
So if you have chosen to study computer science, or if you are in, in, in your first steps in a career path in computer science, I would say do not regret because it, it, it opens, uh, there are a lot of paths that it opens up. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you could, could find your own path, the path that will, would be appealing to you and would make your life, your professional life uh, pretty successful. Let me now move on to a principle that I believe in, which is gender equality. Gender equality uh, recognizes the right of all people to equal rights as citizens in all levels of society and life. Let me make it clear right from the beginning that actions for achieving gender equality do not aim to treat uh, humans of one gender or another as a vulnerable or minority group. It rather aims at creating a more inclusive framework that recognizes the diversity and importance of gender perspective and soaring gender equality as a fundamental principle of democracy. And I would like to repeat this, that gender equality is a basic human right. It is an issue of justice and democracy. It goes up to the level of these great principles like justice and democracy, and it must be provided on the basis of a fair and equal opportunity society. Gender diversity is beneficial for achieving major societal goals and for the healthy evolution of the society, whereas gender inequalities lower well-being, social cohesion, and integration. If you ask me why gender equality in science, I would say that women and men often have different behaviors and utilize different cognitive strategies. So the full utilization of both the female and male capacities is very significant, of crucial importance, I would say, for stimulating innovation. And ensuring gender equality in science and research improves diversity of knowledge, and this results in a better degree of objectivity, equality, and relevance, and also contributes in the production of new ideas. Therefore, the full participation of both women and men in science and technology is necessary it is necessary for developing suitable solutions for all citizens, for improving innovation, and for producing goods and services based on an in-depth knowledge of the society that they target and not of partial knowledge, which could be uh, even dangerous. Let me also point out that the digital market has been developed at extremely high rates the last year, years, so it offers very good employment opportunities, as you can see in this figure. So the red line here shows uh, how the wage uh, um, improves over the, over the years, whereas the blue bars show uh, the ICT employment, and you can see that the trend is, uh, is, is increasing, right? Uh, so, but despite these very good employment opportunities, uh, the current situation is that female students are underrepresented in informatics studies in Europe, uh, and uh, this uh, 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 women under representation trend seems to be persistent because we have not observed significant pro progress in female participation over the past six years or even more. And this is so given that more women than men go to, on to higher edu education. Moreover, the, uh, the, the literature acknowledges the leaky pipeline phenomenon, uh, which basically says that women's participation in the digital labor market decreases with age. Uh, and uh, women uh, are not well represented in top management positions. And uh, the, the levels of participation of women in entrepreneurship in ICT uh, are also low. So the literature, uh, uh, potential reasons that are mentioned in the literature for this situation is a basic, uh, have basically to do with stereotypes. For instance, wrong perceptions that some subjects and fields of study and work are feminine or masculine. Uh, also stereotypes about women's role in society and the workplace. Uh, in addition to stereotypes, uh, a, a big, a big a problem seems to be that uh, there is a small number of role models uh, and to, 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 to become good examples for younger uh, women to, to join the field. And um, uh, it is uh, true that the ICT domain is a traditionally, uh, it has been acknowledged as a traditionally male dominated environment. And in such a male dominated environment, uh, uh, sometimes women are not willing to engage in competition and uh, they, they do not feel that they will have uh, 
fair opportunities to succeed, let's say. But in addition to all these reasons, I would say that uh, uh, in, it is often the case that the gender equality uh, is not, uh, has not been succeeded in, in other aspects of life, for instance, uh, in personal relations or in family. And the result is that uh, women uh, very often uh, have very heavy roles in, in family or in personal life. And this does not allow them to find an easy balance between personal and professional life. And the literature also acknowledges correlations between students' attitudes towards computers and the number of years that they had been using ICT. So education is also extremely important. Here are our resources for, I, I do mention literature from uh, uh, pretty often. So here is uh, uh, studies from all these um, different institutes and um, uh, are our resources. I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail uh, in, uh, into this. Uh, so now let me move on and um, uh, say that despite this situation, there are a lot of women that try to be successful to what they are doing. Here you can see uh, women that uh, either have served or serve now as ACM distinguished speakers. And even more, younger researchers and students are also engaged, and you can see that they follow the same path, the path of technology, uh, which I really, uh, it, it is really pleasurable for me to see that this is so. Here you can see photos from uh, events that uh, the chapter has organized in the past. Let me now uh, spend a few time to say a few words about ACM and uh, what ACM does to um, uh, help uh, improving the situation. ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, is the premier global community of computing professionals and students. It has nearly 100,000 members in more than 170 countries and interacts with more than 2 million computing professionals worldwide. Its mission is to help computing professionals to be their best and most creative, to connect them to their peers, to the latest developments, to inspire them to advance their profession and make a positive impact on society. ACM has established the ACM Council on Women in Computing, which aims at supporting, celebrating and advocating internationally for the full engagement of women in all aspects of the computing field, they do so, they try to do so by providing a wide range of programs and services to ACM members and by working in the larger community to advance the contributions of technical women. Uh, I will not uh, give a lot of details about ACMW, but you can find much more information under this link. And you can see here um, pictures from their events, which are usually very successful. I will move move on to say a few words about Greek ACMW chapter. Of course, you can find all the information about the chapter under our website, and here you can see its, its first page. The, the chapter was established in July 2018 by 43 founding members, among which uh, almost all women in computer science departments in uh, Greek universities, working at computer science departments in Greek universities. Now it lists more than 190 members. You can see some of our members, uh, actually some of our founding members as well in this picture. And here you can see uh, the three uh, women that uh, uh, serve as the, as the officers of the chapter. Uh, from uh, right to left, it's uh, Maria Russo, uh, myself and uh, Georgia Kutrika. Uh, Maria Russo is the vice chair. She's an assistant professor at the National University of Athens. And uh, Georgia Kutrika is our treasurer and she is the director of research in the Athena Research Center. The goals of our chapter is the provision of gender equal access to the computer related scientific from frontiers, the encouragement of women and men to achieve their professional goals and excel in their careers, and the fair and equal celebration and dissemination of professional achievements of both women and men. We have our own channel at YouTube, and uh, you probably noticed, but let me say it, that uh, this event is video recorded, including my talk and all the talks that will come afterwards. And it, it is streamed directly to YouTube. So if you go to this channel, you, will, uh, you could attend this event online, and you could also uh, ask questions through the YouTube channel if you want. 
uh, to communicate with us, uh, we, you can either send an email or you can go to our website. And here I would like to encourage everybody to, that, uh, who is not our member yet uh, to become a member. Uh, we also have our account in Twitter and our account in LinkedIn, and you may want to connect to us through these accounts as well. Uh, let me say that despite the situation that I described, many women in science, I, I have to acknowledge this, that many women in science love their profession. They are passionate about it. They believe that it allows them to be creative and productive, to live a life rich of experiences, full of action, and uh, it gives them a lot of pleasure. They want to have impact in their profession, and they want to contribute in all possible ways to science evolution. And before I close, let me, uh, uh, let me say that you have to fight for prosperity and success in your professional life. Believe to yourselves and focus on your professional goals. While you do so, be flexible. If one path does not take you to the fulfillment of your goals and does not uh, take you to the materializ materialization of your dreams, try another one. And keep in mind that nobody is always successful. It is actually an art when we fail to leave behind what we experienced as a failure and move forward. And this art is extremely significant, not only in our professional life, but also in all other aspects of life, I would say. So you are the ones to determine the rules. This is for the young people, right? Do so, determine the rules according to your dreams, according to what is gonna make you happy and not according to wrong perceptions, stereotypes or any other source of information that comes from external uh, sources. At this point, I would like to thank you very much for being here. I would like to welcome you to JEC 2020 again and I will pass control to Maria Russo, who is here of our first session. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone or good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Faturu. Thank you to everyone who is here. Uh, let me uh, remind everyone or let you know that uh, you can be posting your questions on Slido, slido.com. Uh, you will put in the, the code JEC2020 and we will be able to see them and uh, relay them to the presenters at any time. So um, please do so. And um, I am happy to continue uh, today. And it is our honor and privilege to have um, Professor Geraldine, Geraldine Fitzpatrick with us again. Uh, last year, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick um, was uh, at the first gender equality in computing. She was one of our distinguished speakers uh, with the support of ACM's Distinguished Speakers Program. And this year she is with us from far away from Australia. She cannot be here um, with us in Greece uh, or in Crete. I guess none of us can be in Crete at this point, apart from those who are there already, uh, and where the, the second Jack was intended to take place. Uh, professor uh, Fitzpatrick is a professor of technology design and assessment and heads the human computer interaction group in the informatics faculty at the Technical University of Vienna in Austria. Um, she is an ACM Distinguished Scientist, an ACM Distinguished Speaker, and an IFIP TC13 Pioneer Award recipient. And she has a diverse background with degrees in both computer science and applied positive psychology, coaching psychology, experience working in industry as a UX consulting and a consultant, and a prior background as a nurse midwife so a very diverse indeed background. And in all her work, she takes a concern for people-led perspectives, quality of experience and developing potential. Her research is at the intersection of social and computer sciences with a particular interest in collaboration. My apologies. Um, yes. 
Fairness, Health and Well-Being, and Community Building. Her most recent peer service roles include general co-chair for CHI 2019, papers co-chair for CSCW 2018, and various international advisory boards. She also hosts the Changing Academic Life podcast series. And I think today, uh, given that and her uh, role as a host of Changing Academic Life podcast series, she will attempt to carry out an intriguing workshop uh, titled Red Threads, Choices, and the Good Academic Life. And I understand that the workshops that she, um, uh, that ho she holds, she has ha held in the past are very interactive and um, require participation in a face-to-face -face manner. So this will be a very different media uh, medium, um, but this is a learning experience for all of us. Uh, we are all adjusting to a new way of collaborating and at least the advantages that uh, we can have people from all over the planet participating. So we have uh, attendees registered from all over the planet, uh, literally. So this is one of the great advantages of uh, having this kind of virtual conference this year. So Geraldine, the floor, the virtual floor or the virtual window, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. is yours. <laughs> and uh, we see a really nice uh, view of Brisbane in the background. Oh, That's so where I'm you're not at. seeing, I'm still seeing, let me just see what I can see. So you should be able okay. to share your slides if you wish. I'm, yes, I'm not going to share slides just at the moment. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Maria and Eula for the introductions and setting, Eula for setting up the, the conference. And I am really thrilled to be part of it again. I loved being part of the of the event last year, and I just think what you're doing there in Greece and promoting women and computing and gender gender equality more generally is really exciting. Um, as Maria said, this is a learning experience, and I'm also very intrigued to see how it goes um, because I realised after I proposed the workshop that what I had proposed I would often take a, a whole day or more to go through and really work through slowly so I'm I'd like to invite you to join me in being pioneers with this experiment in what we can do in a short session and through this different sort of medium and of course I'd be really happy for feedback afterwards about what you find works and doesn't work and um, so, because I think it'll be a mutual learning experience. And uh, I, I think that the best way to approach this is thinking about it as me helping us together walk through a thinking process that you could use. Um, we cannot have expectations that we will be able to actually give any deep thought time to any of the issues I'm raising. So it's more I'm going to walk through a process with you that you may choose to pick up on and do something more with after this event. And to facilitate that, there's a worksheet that you can download. There's a link in the chat box. And uh, whether you want to do anything with the worksheet now or just grab pen and paper so that you can scribble some notes, because I'd encourage you to also think of this as a little bubble of space, a little gift to yourself to set, sit back and think about you. And I realized that I actually made a mistake in the title because I said uh, Red Threads Choices and The Good Academic Life as if there is a version of a generic academic life that is good. But what I really strongly believe is that it's your good version of an academic life. And that will be different to what Maria's is or what Eula's is or what mine is or what, what your colleagues are. And the exercises that I'd like us to walk through is helping to identify what that red thread is that is our guiding um, uh, device for what is good for us, for me, um, which will be different to you. 
And I think uh, one of the reasons why I proposed this was on the basis of some of the discussions that we had in the questions after the talk last year, where there are lots of questions about clearly people, many people feeling very overwhelmed um, with never ending demands and opportunities and pressures, you know, some positive, some negative, but still there's a sense of overwhelm. And often I think the experience is that uh, without having a strong sense of who we are and what's important to us, there are some other default measures that come into place against which we end up sort of trying to measure ourselves or make decisions against. And that's often about, you know, whatever the external standards are or measurements that, that uh, academia generally is, is trying to make us perform to. Um, it's sort of whatever our ideal paths that we've, we've we perceive rightly or wrongly that we should be like. Um, and if you ever find yourself talking about shoulds or oughts, uh, or oughts, not oughts, <laughs> shoulds or oughts, then that's, that's a flag to stop and think about why should you or who said you ought to. Um, and if we don't have a strong sense of our own uh, what's important, then these other external pressures will play out for us. And we know that with academia as well, that there's no stopping point. We can always do more. We can always write another paper. Our H index can always be a little bit higher. We can always have another proposal, more PhD students. But does that make sense for what's important to us? Um, so, uh, and the red thread, I think is interesting because um, you would all know, of course, much better than I would, the story of, um, Theseus, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, and you know, having to face the Minotaur in the labyrinth and Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, who fell in love with Theseus and gave him a sword to kill the Minotaur and a ball of red thread so that he could find his way out of the maze, out of the labyrinth. And so it's a nice uh, metaphor for what, you know, understanding what are the things that make up our red threads that become our guide that help us sort of navigate the maze of academia and life more generally. Um, just before we get, before I get started um, talking through, I'd be really interested to know though from you, are there any particular questions or decisions or choices that you're dealing with right now, any particular pressures that you're feeling with? And I'd invite you to use the chat window rather than Slido for this. Keep Slido for the questions um, that Maria will moderate. And if we could just use the chat window because it'll be easy for me to see that. So what are the sorts of things that you might be dealing with now? Um, or, and or, you know, are there, insights or ahas that have come up for you because of the COVID experience. So I know for myself, um, being stuck in Australia and having a, a, a sort of a later overlap time with people back in Europe, I've actually been much better since I've been here about managing my work hours. And I am out in the morning having a really good exercise in some fresh air and just uh, taking it easy. And I, then I start work about 11 and then work on into the evening. And I realized that at home, I often worked on to the same hours in the even, evening, but I would start earlier. So that's something that I'm thinking about, about how do I, when I go back post COVID, how do I manage those work hours? Um, to maintain you know, the value that I've experienced from having them more balanced here. Um, it could be that you're trying to decide what you want to do after your PhD if you're a PhD student or whether you should take up a particular job offer or where do you want your career to go. It could be whether you decide whether you want to be working this weekend on a paper or someone's asked you to take on an admin role and you, you just don't want to do it. Um, but you feel like you ought to. So are there any particular things that are concerning you? May I suggest that um, if someone doesn't want to type and they want to talk, they can raise their hand and we can give them um, voice access as well. 
And may I also remind everyone that we are recording and live streaming. So if you have any issues and concerns about that, then you can just use the chat because that is not recorded. So feel free as we go through if um, to, to actually bring up anything that you want to or raise any questions. Um, once I go into full screen mode, it won't be so easy for me to see the chat. So in the absence of any particular kinds, because uh, uh, I can go on and just start, I'm going to do this in two parts, really. The first part is working through some of the things that you'll see on the worksheet about uh, just thinking through some things like values and strengths and what's important to you. Because if we don't have a good sense of those sorts of things, we don't have any basis against which to make decisions that are in alignment with us, with what's important to us and with our red thread. And then the second part, we'll look at then how we might um, go about trying to manage some of the demands, saying yes or no. And, you know, it should be in the back of your mind referencing, you know, how does this fit my values or whatever. So I just see, I'd love to see your thoughts on how to figure out how many projects to work on. So I have um, a question here or a comment. Yes. Hi, all. Writing my final chapters of my PhD, overwhelmed by the choices after. I feel I need time to digest first what happened during the COVID-19 period. I'd yep. love to hear your thoughts on how to figure out how many projects to work on as a postdoctoral research just starting out and how, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and how to dedicate time to the blocks of own research, collaborations, academic service, science mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. I think this is the same as above. I'm not sure uh, because Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry. This was two different comments. So, yeah. yes. So first was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's great. If, uh, if we can come back to them later on in the session, and we're also going to have a couple of breakouts, and these are also questions that you can bring up and discuss with colleagues as well. I think the answers to any of these questions is there's no single answer and it always depends and there are always trade-offs to every decision and having a better sense of who you are and what's important helps you better understand and weigh up what those trade-offs are. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to go through and do this part one where we identify some of our red threads. As I said, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time going into them in detail. And so don't get too hung up on, uh, you know, if I ask you to identify your values, which I will be, um, just do something that comes to the top of your head for now and just scribble it down. And if it's something that you're interested in, I'll give you some, there are some links at the end that you can go away and do some more detailed work on, or you can ask me, I can follow up with that. But just to start to get a sense of some of the things that could be thought about. Um, just to, so um, Maria, could you stop sharing the screen? Uh -huh. Or you'll stop sharing the screen because then I, and I, I have share, so I should be able to share now. Do you still see my slides? I think no, right? No, 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 no. no. Okay, so think you of this as a it. little bubble of your own headspace and time for you just to reflect and think about things. So the first uh, thread, uh, if I can actually move on my my slides, which is being a bit slow, is what's your why? What's the difference that you want to make in the world or the mark that you want to leave? And this isn't to do with your role, title, um, and what that's about. It's something more fundamentally different about um, why. 
what would you want them to say in your eulogy? So I know for me, say my why might be something about, um, you know, creating environments that support people to develop their best selves. And I can see that I've played out that why when I was a mid, the way, the way in which I was a midwife and when I've worked in industry and in academia. So it's independent of your role. Mate, just scribble some notes. And it may be that um, if you're having trouble thinking about it, this might be just something that might just help you think through that. So this, uh, isn't sort of a strong research base, but it does at least point to some other sort of ways of looking at what's that driver, that thing that drives you, that creates why. Are you someone who's, you know, uh, you just always want to create or you're advocating or you're guiding or you're teaching or you're leading? So they might be some other labels. You're, this isn't, so one of the critiques I often get talking to academics because we can't help being critical and you know that's what we're trained to do very well. Um, none of this is saying that people can only fit into these terms, these are or, or these boxes, or uh, that they capture everything. They're tools to think with. So you can come up with anything you like. What are your values? So your, your values are beliefs that you hold, whether you recognize them or not, um, about the things that are most important to you. And you can think about them as your North Star or compass in a way. that guide what you want to do and how you want to spend your time. So, for example, if one of your values is about relationships, quality relationships, that's something that you might factor in in thinking about how many projects you want to take on. Does that impact your energy, time, or ability to have the relationships that you care about, for example. So again, just whatever comes to mind thinking about it, I can just show you, uh, uh, there's an online tool, a, a value card sorter uh, that you can play with. So this is the result of something that I did a while ago. I'm, you know, I'm sure if I did it today, it might come up a little bit differently, but, um, you know, relationships are important to me, being curious, um, uh, you know, creating balance, hard work. That's, th these are some of the values that are much more important to me than fame or success. So I'm not going to make a decision. If I've got a decision to make about this option of a career that will give me lots of money and fame, but actually, yeah, you know, it doesn't excite me too much, or this option that's not well paid, but where I can really impact people's lives, my values would say that this is the one I'm going to pick. But if wealth and material well-being and fame and success were really important, I'd of course be picking the other because I could carry the trade-off of not making a difference because it's not important to me. So having a sense of what those values are that are important to you can help you. And these are some other, that some, there are gazillions of lists of values that you can find on the web um, if you wanted to. So these might give you some other sort of hints. Again, don't, don't stress about it, just whatever comes top of mind or just seems something that jumps out that reflects you and who you are. And again, just sort of scribbling a short note about it. And then we move on to strengths. Now, strengths are, uh, and there's a huge 
there's a huge research evidence base behind all of these things that I'm saying. I'm not pointing you to the evidence now, but there's a lot of research that points to if we understand what our strengths are and work towards them, there are benefits in all sorts of ways. So strengths are not talents. So they're different. So a talent might be, I've learnt the talent of painting with my, holding a, a paintbrush in my toes and painting with my feet. And I find it fun. But the strength that I would have had to draw on to develop that talent uh, might have been um, perseverance or resilience or something like that. Um, so, and the strength isn't necessarily something that you're just good at either. It's something that you're good at and you really like doing, that there's an energy to it. You tend to gravitate towards these sorts of things. It's what comes most naturally. It's what you do best. And this is not to say that uh, if you only have strengths, you can only, you know, you can't do anything that's a weakness um, because that's a weakness. It's just saying these things come more naturally. And if there are other things that you need in order to do your job or to be successful in whatever way is important to you, some of these other areas you may need to put in more work on. So I'm not very uh, structured in my thinking. I, 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 in, in a way. Uh, so it doesn't come naturally. I find doing detailed planning very boring um, and de-energizing. So I know I have to put in extra effort to do it. Um, and I will often and not choose to do it. It'll be the thing that I'll procrastinate about. So I have to put in, I have to be aware of that and put in extra effort to actually schedule it and make myself sit down and give myself rewards afterwards. But recognizing that it's just not something I do naturally. Other people love it. Uh, you know, give them a spreadsheet and they lock, their eyes light up. Give me a spreadsheet and I want to hide. And these reflect some of your strengths. So again, this is just an example of uh, one um, uh, group from the University of Pennsylvania and, and others who've developed up this strengths profile of character strengths. Um, and they've clustered them under wisdom, courage, humanity, justice, temperance, um, and transcendence. Um, and the stars are, are strengths that come out when I do these, um, if I take their online survey. You know, so that might give you a way to think about what might be some of your strengths. Again, just the, the sort of gut feel for what you would say. And here is another uh, group organizations view of strengths that's more workplace oriented um, and these are more clustered under strategic thinking being you know executing or being sort of more relationship focused or being more influencing focused so you might recognize some of those as particularly about you And if I'm in a live class, I'm, I'm, I know you're live and we're, we're in a live class, but if I'm in a face-to-face -face class, I would often ask people just to say what they might be saying that they relate to. And it's really fascinating in a room to see what the diversity is. And, and going back to that earlier slide with the spark types, um, whether, you know, someone who loves to learn or distill or whatever. Uh, it's really fascinating to see the distribution of people across the audience and across the participants and how we're all different. Even though we're all technically academics or researchers, so we all wear the same role. And what's the um, areas of your life that are most important to you? So if you have a look at your worksheets, there's a circle drawn and you can think about, you know, that's your time or your life or your week or whatever, whatever makes sense for you. And what other things, what are, the, what are the slices of the pie that currently make up your life that reflect what's important to you? 
whether it's whether you want to think about that in terms of the time you allocate or even the energy that you allocate. And it's also really useful to think about what uh, would be your ideal. Are you happy with how that pie, that, that division of the pie currently looks? Given the many, many uh, research studies that you read about academic workload and working hours and many of the anecdotal conversations I have, I would suggest that many people sort of pie uh, quarters for work are much bigger than what they actually want them to be relative to the other things that they want to also have in their life that maybe they're not able to give enough time to. And it's worth thinking about all of this as being different. So um, if I, uh, if, if we think about um, who's people who are an academic, why could you be an academic? So again, you know, we don't, it's hard to get quick feedback from people or to see a chat, but um, often you get, you hear responses like, I'm an academic because I want to shape the next generation. I want to make a difference to young people's lives. I'm an academic because I just want to discover new things. I'm, or I'm academic because I'm really curious. And you might think about what other ways or reasons other people might have for being an academic. So again, we all have the same title, but what we're doing it for and what we bring to it is very different. And that's brilliant that we can do that. So um, I'm going to just skip that because I, I want to just um, invite you now just to think about what we've, I've got my pieces of paper here and they're all over the place and now I can't see where I'm up to. Um, so in thinking about that and just getting a bit of a sense of who you are, what's going on for you, what might be important. Um, I'd like to invite you to be to move into breakout rooms and Maria will set that up now. We'll do it for about eight minutes and just uh, say hello to one another, but maybe just share with one another. I don't know, it could be what were any ahas that came out of that or any thoughts that you have. Um, think about what might be actually working well now? How can you, how do you see things in your life currently working really well? And how do they currently align with your values and strengths and, um, and you know, honor the, all the areas of your life that are important? And or you could dream about imagining what it would be like if something that isn't working so well now was working well. And what would that look and feel like? So use this time for however, wherever you're at and whatever you're thinking about now in relation to who you are as your version of an academic, whether you're a PhD student or a faculty member or, or um, working in industry. So Maria, do you want to... Um, Yes, I will. Uh, um, our, we will have our help from Manos to do this. Um, how many would you like us to create? So if, if we do three people per group, so okay. it'll only be a short chat, but it's just to provide a little bit of a break and a little bit of a chance for you just to think out loud, talk out loud and, and to share. Okay, so I see we are about 50 participants. Mm -hmm. So... So we um, did say 16 will, yeah. groups. Okay, so I've, I, I, I assume that everybody has been invited already to a breakout room. Uh, I see that Manos has been able to create some. And if, you could sure. remove, if you could remove me from the breakout room and then I could just have a look at the chat. Okay, I will ask. And 
people will get a, a warm, when we say, you know, uh, you'll get a warning that the rooms are going to close in X sec a minute or something or two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see people are already joining. So we're down to 26 participants now. Okay. Um, I am not joining mine. Okay. Um, However, everyone's muted, I think. Um, oh, are they, is, is it possible to unmute people for the breakouts? Okay. So Mano said that he will be unmuting everyone. Okay, uh, some people are alone in the breakout room. So. So how much time do we give them? Um, uh, maybe just six minutes now. Is that too little, do you think? Or I, I had said eight. Maybe something like, yeah, seven. Hit the middle. Yeah, it's coming back at quarter to the hour. Um, so I think um, I have some participants saying that they're alone in the breakout room. Because maybe some, uh, some people did not join uh, the breakout room. So Whoever's here uh, still, um, you should have received an invitation to join a breakout room. Please do so and uh, please speak to the other participants that are in there for about five minutes and then uh, you will get a warning that the time is um, finishing and you will be automatically transferred back to the main room. And uh, Geraldine, are you able to see the chat? I am when I'm not showing the slides. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked out. Um, how to do it, I wonder. I'm wondering if I can. I'm going to try joining Zoom. <clears throat>
So would you like me to keep up, keep the time a bit more? You, or would you like to tell me when? How do you, when, um, how do you want to go about this? Do you mean for bringing people for back? For bringing people back, yes. Um, how, what is the warning one minute or two minutes? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it's two minutes because I yeah. was, I didn't test yeah, it out now, it, but when I had used it, uh, I remember it was a very short warning. Yeah, so, I think it's a minute then. So we could, we could just um, give the warning to bring people back, I guess, because I, I think it's not been a, if there, if there are a lot of people who are sitting on their own still, or. Okay, so it's a one minute countdown, I'm being mm -hmm. told from the control room. <laughs> so <laughs> they have sent it already. <laughs> because apparently as a co host, I cannot uh, share them into breakout rooms, only the host can do that. So there's a super user and then <laughs> Yes, and I, I realized that um... I'm used to being a host with the breakout room, so I can see um, what's happening or who's there. And it's different being. Yes, I, I did this with and my students and uh, I didn't have the ability to have co-hosts, so it was really yeah. difficult to manage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 15 seconds. We will start seeing people. Oh, I see the number already increasing to 42. Uh, meanwhile, if I may, Maria, this is Vicky. Uh, Hi, Vicky. Uh, it was wonderful to have these uh, breakout sessions and to elaborate a little bit to what we heard uh, uh, from uh, Geraldine beforehand. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks. Great. So someone who came back yeah. <laughs> can share <laughs> from the black and, hole of the breakout room. <laughs> and who, and with who had positive. So <laughs> we, we will do another breakout room later on. So I wonder if the student volunteers could make sure uh, when you when you first do the breakout room allocation, because it does a random, if the Student volunteers could then explicitly remove the organisers who aren't participating or me not participating so that people aren't left in a room on their own. Mm. That, that could be good. So um, welcome back. We, we had uh, one very one positive feedback. Thank you, Vicky, uh, <laughs> that it was good to at least just have a short chance and I know it's only short and maybe there will be other opportunities in the course of this time or having these sorts of conversations with your own colleagues. Um, if it's okay with you, I won't do any sort of feedback now from anything that came out of that discussion so that we can just go on and look at some of the um, inputs now to thinking about what might be uh, how do you make choices? You know, if you have a better sense of who you are and what's important, then then there's sort of you still got to do the thing about you know deciding what's what you do. And there are lots of questions that have been and, and situations that have been raised in the chat that I'd like to get to at the end after we've gone through um, some of this discussion and just see. So um, I'm just going to share the screen again. So just in, um, so I'm not seeing the chat now, if there's anything that comes through. Can I see the chat still? It doesn't matter. 
Um, uh, you, Marie, you can tell me if there's anything yes. extra. Yeah, Marie, so, I can pass the, the, the questions to you if you want. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we still have to make choices, as I said. So I want to sort of approach this bit in uh, setting up some constraints at the beginning that sort of constrain our choice space, our decision space, and then look at some strategies for how we might go about making some of those decisions. So one of the really um, uh, important things that I don't know about you, but I'm often very bad at remembering is actually what can I control and what can't I control? And how much time do we spend sitting out at this, you know, everything else that we can't control, stressing about it and worrying about it, when there's nothing we can do to change that, that situation. And if we can have a better sense in, in thinking about what are the things that are directly within my sphere of control, because they're the things that I should be directing my energy towards. And there may be things out here, uh, outside of control that we can't do anything about, but maybe there are some things in the longer term that we can try to influence so that they will change. We don't have the control of whether things actually will. Um, so you know, one of the reasons why I started the podcast series was I'm so frustrated by the, the performance pressures in academia around H indexes and the way we measure academics that creates all sorts of um, weird pressures and the, and the, the crazy... Uh, research funding schemes and issues going on there. Now, these are, these are issues that are uh, made at uh, policy levels, at governmental levels and intergovernmental levels. So they're European wide or you know, because of the academic nature of the work, we travel and can work in different countries. So I still need to have um, you know, a publication record that can stand at somewhere else that I want to work. So I may not be able to change a university's policies right now about their criteria for appointing someone, but what I can do as a sphere of influence is I can, whenever I sit in an appointment committee, try to draw attention to a more holistic view of a person and their performance and what they could bring. And I started the podcast series also to try to have more of a discussion and a debate about, you know, can we shift the conversations more generally and what can we do? So what's directly within our sphere of control? That's, that's the first thing to think about. What can I actually do something about and recognise explicitly what I can't and work out how to live with that? And what's 86,400? Anyone got an idea? That's the limit of your seconds in a day. It doesn't matter what you can do. This is one of the things you have no control over. You only have 86,400 seconds. What are you going to do with them? So you can't control the number of seconds, but what fills that? And this is where it becomes really important to understand what are your values? What are your important areas? Who, what, why are you saying yes to? Um, and recognising that everything that you say yes to is saying no to something else. Now, wouldn't that be a shame if what you were saying no to in saying yes to writing this other paper or getting this other proposal in or other granted, um, was saying no to family if you've decided that family is also really important. So I had, you know, there, then there are discussions about how you negotiate and navigate and where, you know, how do you, how do you allocate? But it's recognising that this is a limited resource and our decisions, we are, we're making decisions about what we fit in this time and we can't do everything. And I think it's really useful also to think about what we want to say yes to. So if I want to say yes to time with my husband at the weekend, 
then in order to honour that yes that's really important to me, I necessarily have to say no to working on a paper at the weekend and work out how to be cleverer with my time during the week to maximise what work I can do on the paper. And so there's always thinking, I, often people sort of say, we have to learn to say no more. I think we have to learn to say yes more, but yes to what's important, because if we can say yes to what's important, then that necessarily means there are going to have to be some no's because it's always trade-offs. So it's think, worth thinking um, about thinking. So, you know, often we're approached to uh, do something, we get requests um, or we have opportunities and sometimes we can think that we need to respond straight away, especially if that's someone who's in a high level of management asking us to do something or someone who we think will be uh, involved in somehow later evaluating us. And I think a, a really good first strategy that we can, we can all try out is uh, take time to think and respond rather than react to any requests that we have um, to, to, to do something, to take on more work or to explore opportunities. Now, Oftentimes, we often just talk about, uh, think about sort of the bad work. But one of the things we also often hear with academics is it's like drowning in chocolate. Now, it's not just bad work, but there's so much good work. There's so many exciting things to do and so many exciting opportunities and you want to do them all. And especially if, you know, one of your sort of whys is somehow to make a difference. And these are all opportunities for you to make a difference in ways that you think matter. Um, so it's not just saying no to the things you don't want to do, you know, or that are drudgery, but it's sometimes it's saying no to the things that you really want to do that are that's even harder. And so that's why we need to work out strategies for uh, stopping and saying thank you. Maybe he said it. Thank you for the invitation. That sounds really interesting. Can I go away and think about it and get back to you? Um, sometimes even just. Even if you want to, if you need to respond in the moment, just literally taking a micro break, going, hmm, yeah, that sounds interesting. And doing a quick think, but give yourself a little bit of a stop, whether it's a longer stop or a, um, a shorter stop. And you might want to ask them for more information. You may think that there are ways that, um, uh, you could let me I, let me just move on to this next one. Um, it may be that you want to sort of think about, you know, like what are my reasons for saying yes or no, and are they good reasons? Um, am I the best person? Is there anyone else who could do this? What's the time frame? I, is there any room for flexibility in negotiation? I can do this bit of it, but not that bit. I can. You asked it to, for it to be done by Tuesday, but is it you know could is Friday possible? Um, if I say yes to this, what would I need to say no to? That's, that can be a bit of a stopper sometimes. Or if, especially if it's someone who's in a, a management admin position, a management position with you, what could you take off me so that I could do this? Because remember, you only have that limited finite time. So, Focus on what we can control. Um, recognise we have no control over the amount of time, but we do have control over the choices of how we spend that time. And thinking, taking time to stop and pause and really making considered decisions. And think, you know, seeing here that we have options to think through this. We don't have to feel pressured straight away to respond. And um, what might... <clears throat> So I'm going to, I, I want to move on a little bit, um, but maybe in your break, next breakout groups, you may want to think about what are some good reasons for saying yes and what are some bad reasons for saying yes. You can skim them briefly. I won't 
just in the interest of time, I won't talk through them. So there can be bad reasons for saying yes. And similarly, what are some good reasons for saying no? And what are some bad reasons for saying no as well? And then, uh, uh, sorry. yeah. Just let me know when when we should uh, do the next breakout. Yes, I'm going. That's why I'm not going to speak through these. I'm trying to get to. There's a little, just a little bit more I want to okay, say okay. So, that yeah. we can then talk about. So there's. Sure. Then we can also think about what are the strategies for saying yes or no. Um, you know, and I, I want to. I want to draw attention to paying paying attention to your gut. Um, even though we're academics and we're rational thinkers and, and scientists, there's also value in listening to your gut. I know that sometimes I've said yes to something because I feel like I ought to, and then I've had a sleepless night or I'm just, my gut is just going, oh, what did you do this for? And I, and I know that I've made the wrong decision. Sometimes I've gone back to the person and said, you know, I really, I really can't do this. And other times, I know that I've made a commitment by saying yes, that I need to see through. So I need to work out how I can change my relationship to that job and find something, some reason or value in, in doing it. And this is where I want to point to some other powers that we have, um, which are uh, we can change and shape a lot of what we do as well to connect better to our values and strengths and our why. So we may have a task which might be delivering a lecture, but how we do it, we have control. We may be allocated that lecture by the head of the faculty, but how we deliver that lecture. And um, I haven't asked the person's permission to share this, so I will share it anonymously and they can volunteer who they are if they want to. But um, someone was telling me about being given a database class to teach that wasn't their area and they didn't really want to, but they had to. But I would guess that if we looked at their strengths, creativity would be one of their strengths and the love of learning. And they, they reshaped that course with very creative ways of getting the students involved in data sets that they would care about. So being still doing the same task, but having the ability to shape it in line with what you're doing, what you care about, what you're good at doing. We can also shape it in terms of who we do it with. It can be more fun doing it with other people. Or we can say, I'm not very good at doing uh, spreadsheets, but I know that Mary loves spreadsheets. So Mary, why don't you and I work together on this task? Because we can complement one another with our strengths. And then there may be other things that I don't have any choice about at all. And I need to find a way to change the way I think about them. And I, I can tell the story of a friend who, in her job was required to do this very detailed timesheet keeping that she used to hate. And at the end of the day, she had to write down how many minutes and microseconds she spent on all these different tasks. And what she did through doing one of these strengths exercises was realize that she loved learning. And so what she did was turned her thinking around when she had to do that boring, what was a boring time sheeting task at the end of her day. And she used it as an opportunity to reflect on what have I learned from doing that thing that I'm just documenting in my time sheet. So she, she changed her thinking about it to connect to something that she cared about. So um, let's, uh, there are some couple of people in the podcast who um, you may find interesting to listen to because they talk about interesting different ways that they've also uh, shaped their work. So uh, there's reasons for saying yes, no. There's the ability to say, to shape and shape in different ways. And then there's the planning that we can be doing as well. So how do you proactively schedule? And that was one of the questions as well about how many um, you know, reviews or how much time, how, how, how many committees do you sit on in or how much block of time do you spend on each thing? Um, and 
in the back of the worksheet, there are some links to some work that uh, Anna Cox and Amy Coe have both done, where they have both deliberately tried to sit down and plan and document how many proactively plan. So then they can say, when they get their 10th PhD thesis um, exam request to do, they can say, I'm sorry, I've already done the, the six that I've committed to for this year and I don't have capacity to take on any more. So it's taking control in a proactive planning way. So that can be planning in the bigger sense of how much travel are you prepared to do, um, how much time away, et cetera, but also planning in the day-to-day -day sense. Put things in your diary. And one of the things that we're often very bad at is not putting in our own things in the diary so that our diary gets filled up by everyone else's things. And this is where it's really important to prioritize your own work and the things that you love doing that make you feel energized, the things that do connect with your strengths. And if you prioritize those, and then some of the research says you only need sort of 40, 20%, 40%, depending on the study of time spent doing that really great stuff that you love doing, that makes all the rest of it okay to do. But if you don't put in your own work into your diary, it won't happen. So that should be some of the first things we block out. Um, so we might just stop now and move into another breakout room. Um, and we'll do this until quarter past. And in the breakout room, um, just have a think about what are the issues for you in saying yes or no? What are the insights you have about what you can control and what you can't? What might be some of the things that you could shape that you hadn't thought of before? What are, there, what are the strengths that you have that you could actually bring to a job to transform it or to make it more interesting? What are the planning strategies that you might have? So again, whatever makes sense for you where you're at, but just whatever's triggered in the discussion here. And maybe if we can have groups of three or four, Maria, just to help balance for people who may not be um, joining. And I would just invite you to be honest and open. It's okay to be vulnerable and to share because that's the other thing. We're all in the same boat, but we're all often so good at projecting our academic persona that we don't share enough that, that you know we're struggling and it's not that we're struggling we're all learning and we all have so much to offer each other if we share um, our own uh, strategies and insights so think about this as sort of you know an honest safe space to share that's a confidential space as well So we have created um, groups of um, they could be four or maybe five people and if by any chance you are alone you have the ability to exit the room the breakout room so uh, please do not feel <laughs> uh, that uh, you have to stay so I think that uh, Manos is ready to
Maria, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Okay, it was very short. Uh, I'm not sure how much everyone was able to say. We had it at five minutes, and I'm sorry I didn't ask uh, Geraldine beforehand how long you, you would like us to leave the breakout rooms, but I was in one, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you were trying to communicate the time. I hope it's okay. Sorry, I was sort of saying come back at quarter past, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Wait, that's okay. Three more we're, minutes. We're good. We're good. Um, so we could just leave it open. I, I, I want to finish off with a couple of things at the end. So I'd like to take the last sort of five minutes or a you know, few minutes less maybe just to finish off at the end. Um, but for the next little bit, are there any particular things that people want to discuss? The, the people who um, made comments in the chat room. So I'm, I'm curious whether um, that the person, Kate Rogers, who asked about how many projects to work on as a postdoctoral researcher just starting out. Do you have any thoughts on that now for yourself? If you're, if, if you're comfortable speaking, you don't have to. So this is no pressure, even though I've just put you so, in pressure. Uh, Geraldine, um, Will you be sharing slides or would you like me to, to share the Slido where we have passed all the Zoom comments into and we can have them visible for everyone? What, what would you prefer? Um, I am not sharing slides at the moment. I will at the end for the last couple of minutes. Okay, so if you'd like us to share the, the, uh, the, the comments and questions, we mm -hmm. can do that now and we can come back to your slides in a bit. Unless people want to come off, will that take up the screen? Like can people see the questions on Slido or the chat window so that we can see people? So um, you should be seeing mm -hmm. now uh, the Slido. Yeah. The Slido includes everything that was put into the Zoom chat up to now. Mm -hmm. And uh, whoever can manage many windows can also open the chat if they want to. Is that so okay? Did, yeah, great. So and these are with anyone... the order they appeared, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm just um, before before we sort of can walk, we can walk through some of those, but for anyone who's put a question in, do you have, would you be willing to share anything that you're already starting to think about how you might answer that question for yourself? That's okay. It's always tough in these sorts of online sessions. It's not the same sense of group, is it? Um, and, and learning to do that. So I can pick up, uh, just walk through and just respond. But normally I'd love to also um, um, get- I'm sorry to interrupt. I do have a question. Um, there's a hand that has been uh, raised by Adriana Wild, and I think she had put in the first comment. So should I let her speak? Yes, Is that that's okay? brilliant. Yes, thank okay. you, Adriana. So Adriana, you should be unmuted now and you should be yes, able- thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine, for that uh, very nice uh, view of you know, helping us navigate through your workshop, uh, what is important to us. So my- my original question was like, like I call like at this uh, junction in my immediate future, and then it was like thinking about whether I should go to a to a research uh, fellow position just mm -hmm. to build up my CV and become more employable at a better institution, maybe, or just start as a lecturer in maybe not such a high rank institution. And because my values, I I, I really am 
I'm, it's very important to me to reach out, to communicate, you know, to, to influence, to guide people, you know, perhaps even more than the, the top court, uh, corner of your diagram in which, in which you have. Like, I think I would not thrive as a research fellow without any teaching. And, mm -hmm. and I probably, obviously, we need to explore this more, but I feel a bit more clear about what I want to do. And it's such mm -hmm. a good tool, this thing about mm -hmm. the values. So thank you for right. that. And um, Adriana, it could also be worth thinking about time perspectives as well, you know, because if you've identified that, you know, being able to develop people as being so important, um, are there ways that, are there paths that might make that stronger later on or not? Um, we never know. So the, a recent podcast I put out was with Peshman um, and he said, you know, that he always sort of stresses about making these decisions and it's only when he looks back he can see how they've made sense or how they've worked out. So I think that's something that's worth remembering as well there are ways that things do have a habit of working out and having that sense of that that's important and you know i heard in your voice that you know there was sort of more excitement thinking about going into a lecturing job and then you may want to also think about other factors around that um, that are reflected in someone else's comment question about how the COVID situation has made them realize how many choices we're making right now um, and, you know, so does going to this other institution influence any other things that are also important to you? Um, you know, so it can be worth thinking about those, those issues. I, I can also point you to the podcast discussion with Evan Peck, E-V-A-N-P-E-C-K, because he had a lovely um, explanation of his decision in a very similar way to what you've talked about to take a teaching, a, a job that was quite teaching intensive in not a high profile research institution, but a different sort of institution in the US and why he did that. And he sort of talks through the values that were important to him about family and community living and, and, and his love of teaching. And even though a lot of people were saying, oh, but you're not gonna go to a research intensive you know, university. He said, it, that's not what was important to him. So you may find his discussion really useful, really interesting. Okay, great. Um, so the writing the final chapters of my PhD and being overwhelmed by the choices after. So can you take time after to just what's happened? And I think uh, Calliope, I'm sorry, has also, um, she has some sound problems, so she cannot follow up uh, through mm -hmm. voice, but she has followed up um, on uh, with a, with a comment at the end right here. Great, that's great. There are lots of questions around career paths because there are so many choices that we can make. And well, there are so many things that we might be able to apply for, whether we have control over whether we get jobs as well is another thing. But again, having a sense of all of these aspects that are important can be useful for figuring into some of the thinking about it. Um, the comment from Katerina about COVID making you realize how choices um, affect, so about all the, I've lost the comment, but how all the very many choices that you make um, that's really interesting. As a researcher who uses a lot of qualitative methods where we go and observe people, we often talk about the value of breakdowns and things that go wrong for highlighting what's important. And I think COVID, while it's been incredibly difficult and challenging for people, has also served for lots of people to highlight 
what is important. Um, and that sounds like something that you're recognising there through the COVID experiences. Um, I have put the, the rest of the comment, I'm sorry, um, up on top. So it's, uh, it's after the love-hate relationship with mm, traveling, uh, yeah. there's the, the contradiction that she loves meeting new people and yeah. places and working with students and colleagues. She has raised yeah. her hand so I can have her say it rather than me. Perfect. Okay. So please go ahead, Katerina. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. It was a long because uh, I realized there are many contradictions that we're facing. And I'm reflecting all this period about the the, the benefits versus the, the, the difficulties of, of going online. And, and right now I realized how difficult were the two room making thing about also how the context affects all these choices. I mean, in, in the first we were very talkative, the second was more quiet. So uh, yeah, I guess there are many, many parameters that we have to think yeah. about. But this is yeah. something I'm reflecting all this period, how, uh, how, how the communication, it, we, among people affects us to online, but also face to face is something that I'm thinking about a lot mm. this period. Yeah. And how it affects all yeah. these choices and saying yes versus saying no, or uh, being able to, 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 um, to identify what are the values or, you know, like sometimes you know, we need to hide them or mm. express more or we, yeah. we kind of, you know, like, become a kind of academic chameleon sometimes. That's how I feel sometimes. Mm. And what, I think what you're bringing up as well highlights that um, we're not individuals, we're also entwined in this academic community. And so, you know, there's no choice now but for this conference to be online. Well, there is a choice. It's not happen or it's online. So as... Uh, an option to it not happening, this is a good option. But is that an option that we want as a peer community going forward all the time? You know, and there are the trade-offs around travel and building peer relationships and what that might mean for the quality of our work as well. And so it could be interesting to also think about how you become part of peer community discussions because I think, again, as academic communities, I'm seeing lots of responses where people are starting to question exactly as you have done, you know, this love-hate relationship with all of the travel and, you know, the, pe the increasing concern about the environmental impact as well as the time and cost impacts. Um, but against that, the benefits. And I think a lot of peer communities are very actively thinking now, um, even when the COVID situation is better, about how we can do some more hybrid model and... So it could be interesting to be part of those discussions because what sort of things does it make sense to do more online and what not? And how do we get the right blend? And knowing that there's no right answer to anything like this and it's all trade-offs. But it is interesting to use these the disruption of this time to reflect on what it's showing us. Because I know I... Um, I, I uh, look back in my calendar for the first few months of this year and the amount of travel I had was ridiculous. Now, I, when I said yes to things, I thought it was fine and they were all things that I wanted to do. Some of it was the drowning in chocolate thing, um, but you still drown. And, you know, I think now, you know, how could I have done all those? I'm crazy, you know, because I'm still struggling just to get through my day to day here uh, to keep, you know, move my teaching online, which I think also brings the point to the other question about, uh, the female, some of the female research colleagues who've had a really tough time focusing on their work. Of course, I mean, there's so many stories about this. And there are other colleagues who've never been so productive, who've been able to pump out lots of papers and proposals, but they're often the colleagues who uh, don't have kids or have a partner who looks after the kids and they can just lock themselves in the bedroom. And I hear also from many, many female colleagues sharing similar experiences about just having a tough time focusing on their work, not just from the stress, but also just from competing demands and having no downtime at all. And there's a, um, you know, there's a response that says, 
we need to work out how to give ourselves a break and say, it's okay, we just do the best we can. And if today, at the end of the day, all I can celebrate is that I got through the day without cracking up, that's an achievement. And just to be kinder to ourselves and, give, and to recognize that we can just do our best and that's it, and we not take on external pressure. If you're in a management or a relationship with people, I think we have a very big responsibility to say to the people who are working for us or in our groups or teams, to give them that message explicitly and to say, it's okay. It's been important for me to role model in my own group when I'm having troubles dealing with the, the situation here and the stress because we're COVID stranded in Australia and I've struggled to get work done and some days I haven't been very productive. So I try to also be honest and role model and, and sort of share that with my group as well to say that it's okay. Um, and then there are others of us who may be reading the CVs of these women in a year's time or two years time as they apply for promotion or tenure or um, a new position somewhere. And we need to remind the committee about this time and the um, disproportionate impact it has had on women. And there are um, lots of research uh, that's coming out that is actually documenting this that we can explicitly point to. Um, I'm just aware of the time. Um, and I would just like to take the last two minutes just to finish off on one thing, if it's okay. If I could share my screen again, Maria. Yes, of course. So please go ahead. So I, I want to um, just get us to commit to one small thing, because it's one thing to just have a little bit of time to think about this, but what are you going to do next for you? Now, it could be that you take the worksheet and you actually spend, you, know, you block off some time in your calendar and spend some time actually thinking through a bit more and, and using it as sort of an exercise. Or you may um, ha already have identified something that you think you could already want to change or to do differently or do in some way. So think about that. And there's some... Uh, suggestions in the worksheet for how to think through that but can see if there's one thing that one small thing that you can commit to now and in recognizing that uh, there's not everything that is within your control you know you may find it useful to map it out in this sort of way that looks at you know what do I want to do I want to set clear boundaries that really honor all the areas in my life that I want to devote the right chunk of the pie to um, and that value, that reflects my values in wanting to spend time with my partner and having quality time to exercise. So how am I going to do that with, that's within my control? I'm going to stop working at 6 p.m. And what are the strengths I can use to try to do this? Um, <clears throat> and again, sort of, you know, so that if I, uh, you know, sort of gratitude that I might just take a couple of minutes at the end of the day to document what I did achieve, which as I said, may just be that I got to the end of the day, which is can be a big achievement some days, especially at these times. Um, or I may use uh, my creative strength to make some sort of interesting sign that reminds me that's a visual reminder. Um, and what, what else I can do? I might leave um, the, the off, make sure I leave the office and make sure that I don't open devices after six. And then other things that I can influence, you know, I can't stop people trying to contact me or phone me, but I can tell them that I'm not going to read emails so I can manage, try to manage expectations and I can't control their behaviour. So you may want to think about that. And I'd be interested if in the chat or Slido, what would you prefer, Maria? If people could just, you know, if there's a commitment that you want to make right now, just write something in and share it because I think seeing what other people are doing can also be really encouraging. You can use whatever is easier for you. Uh, so uh, to you, so slido.com, the code is GEC, Jack 2020, or the Zoom chat. Slido.com goes directly to uh, Slido and I can share the screen again so we can see it. Uh, 
and I will also be looking at the uh, participant list to see if there are any raised hands. Okay, and Geraldine has shared in the chat the link to the podcast series. Which is changing academic life, one word, dot com. And I've lost my mouse here. Where's my mouse? <laughs> I found it again. Um, so uh, we should be finishing now as time's up, but I do encourage you just to think about taking one small specific, committing yourself to one small specific thing following this, because otherwise we go back into our busyness um, and into the craziness of our day sometimes, and these things get lost. And schedule them into your diary. Make time for yourself. Because if you make time for yourself, you'll be a better researcher and a better person, a better partner, a better friend. It's not selfish. It's selfish not to, as I think I said last year as well. And I just want to reinforce that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this um, difficult, I may say, feat of ho hosting such a, an interactive workshop uh, in uh, a, a difficult situation. I realize we all need about five screens to be able to <laughs> do this. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone who participated. You can also take the, uh, the worksheet uh, as a takeaway uh, a handout uh, and reflect on that. Uh, if there are uh, no other comments or questions, we will have a short break, about a 15 minute break, um, or even less, a bit less, and we'll be back at 11.45 EEST for the industry talks session. Thank you, Geraldine. That was excellent. <laughs> and I would encourage the uh, uh, the speakers for the industry talk session to be uh, in Zoom a little uh, before that, please. Before 11.45, um, I think it's all, yes, for everyone, it's EEST uh, e -E -E time. That's Greek time. So thank you. <laughs>